This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello everybody and welcome to Writers on Film. My name is John Bleasdale. I am a writer and film critic and today I'm going to be talking to friend of the podcast, Ian Nathan. He has been on before talking about Ridley Scott and talking about his book on Peter Jackson and now he's here talking about one of my favourite filmmakers, Clint Eastwood. Uh, we go into it deeply and Ian's book is concentrating on Eastwood's role as a film director. So that's uh, sort of the area that we go into most deeply, although we talk about about other things surrounding is a really interesting conversation i'm sure you'll like it please remember to if you do like it like subscribe do all those things that um that help us to build as a podcast we've got lots of like listeners now and i'm very proud of of how far we've come and we've really done it all with your help dear listener so if you're new to the podcast let's get some new people involved and if you're uh, if you're not new then uh, carry on the good work okay uh, before you do any of that enjoy the conversation It's kind of where you have to start is that you know, the nature of the book as a written and as part of that series of books is that it's him as a filmmaker primarily. So you have to kind of put that in front of the stardom. But of course, that's almost impossible. You know, they are absolutely entwined in, in who he is and, and who he is as director and who is his star. You know, they're not really separate things. And I don't think he thinks, you know, his favorite leading man, as I say in the book, is Clint Eastwood. And mm. It's a really interesting journey to think of him. You know, what is the point where the world, and certainly Hollywood, stopped conceiving of him as the guy who played Dirty Harry, probably the biggest star of the, the 70s, and started thinking of him as Hollywood's elder statesman, you know, the great filmmaker who presides in his kind of gentlemanly way over the whole industry. And... What does that mean? And also to kind of almost strip that away a bit as well, the the kind of august idea of Clint Eastwood icon and say, well, you know, ask questions like, why wasn't he conceived of a, as a 70s filmmaker? Mm. Why wasn't he one of the, the brats? I mean, you know, I'm sure he wouldn't think of himself in that way, but he was making films like Outlaw Josie Wales and you know, Play Misty for me, even that were doing similar things that were playing on similar ideas, but it's about... The fact that he was still this huge star, I think, is the reason people didn't view him as seriously. They kind of went, well, he's just the guy, he's the action hero. The guy says nothing on the screen. That kind of weird sort of charismatic minimalism that he uses as a kind of acting kind of tool um, was great. And everyone loved it. But it also sort of diminished the, the view of him, I think, as an artist. And it took almost... I think to get to Unforgiven before critics and even academics, I think the French got there first, as they always do. Yeah. <laughs> Damn said, them. <laughs> yeah. So no, he, he is, you know, he's vital. And I, I for me, and, I, and again, I put it in the book, I think the comparison you almost make with Eastwood is sort of beyond even Spielberg and Scorsese and Coppola and those people. It's kind of with Steinbeck and Faulkner and, the kind of the great writers of the American myth or the great explorers of the American myth, if you want, you know, that looked mm. at the way the country was born and the way it grew up and became. So for obviously for Eastwood, that, that's the Western through all the kind of films he's made to present day. But there's that kind of feeling of his subject is America and his subject is um, that landscape of America, in, in a sense, its vastness and its and it's kind of the way it formed its own mythology. And I think that's what I, I found fascinating about him right through to now. Even if you watch a film maybe as humble as Cry Macho, you know, the, the last one he made and starred in, he, you know, you see his face against a landscape and it's still there. And there's still a mm. sense of him as his kind of great edifice of you know, American culture, that he, he's one of the most important figures, you know, in American artistic life, because he's inescapable. And, he, you know, he's been there since the late 1950s and remains 
I mean, as we speak, he's editing another film. So, you know, he hasn't stopped and he's well into his 90s. It's interesting that comparison with the 1970s filmmakers, because it makes me think that one of the major differences might be, and this ties in with the appreciation of the French, that those 70s filmmakers like Friedkin and Coppola and and, uh, Scorsese, they were all very influenced by the French New Wave. Arthur Penn as well, Bonnie and Clyde was, you know, kind of actually Francois Truffaut was going to make it at one point, and Goddard, I think, had, had a hand in it. Whereas you don't get that feeling that Eastwood is particularly interested in the French. Not that he's not interested in international film. You make the point of Kurosawa being a big influence on him. But the fact that he's so solidly American means that he's he's trying, he's, he's, you know, wholeheartedly, there's no inferiority complex there. He's wholeheartedly trying to do something American. And the French love that. They love Howard Hawks. They don't love, they don't want to see someone trying to be French. Yeah, absolutely. And he's, yeah, he worked within the system and he he managed to work within the system at a time when, you know, the, the old studio order, which he kind of grew up a little bit with when he first got into the business, you know, they were still around. You know, he met Jack Warner, you know, he knew uh, the end of that era, but he's almost, he carried it on a little bit. He, he was part of the studio and is part of the studio system. His relationship with Warner Brothers has been like a I suppose it's not quite a contractee, but it, it's very much along the lines of what Howard Hawks had with studios and Hitchcock and, and the kind of the era of filmmakers that came before. So yes, in, in that sense, he's more traditional. He's mm-hmm. more old fashioned. He, you know, he grew up in Northern California, quite an itinerant childhood during the depression, moving around slightly Steinbecky. And his father would just take jobs where he could get them to feed the family. And I think that had a huge influence um, sort of spiritually on on, on mm-hmm. the way Eastwood operated as a, as a kind of celebrity and a director, that the work is what matters and you, you don't complain, you get on with it. And you don't bring that kind of artistic fuss to what you do. But that doesn't mean to say he's any less the artist. It just means to say his attitude wasn't that of a, a sort of auteur uh, who didn't sort of, he doesn't like to talk about himself in, in very much. So I think you're right. I think he's very much uh, an American, but there are sort of odd ingredients that shake it up a bit. You know, his love of jazz music, enormously important to who he is as, as a person. Uh, he is a musician. Um, I mean, he wanted to be a jazz pianist. That's what he wanted, but knew he's one of those things, you know, Salieri like that. He knew he was good enough to know he wasn't good enough mm. you know, to be a, a great. So he drifted away from it, but has carried on playing, obviously written his own scores. But if you start to look at the way he makes films and the style of his films as director, there's a looseness. There's a kind of jazz-like improvisation about what he did. He doesn't stick necessarily to full narrative you know, laws and rules. He breaks the rules. You know, very few of his films, you know, naturally fit into the genre you assume them to be. Yes, mm. he, he makes westerns, and they're obviously westerns, but they're very different from John Wayne's westerns. They're very different from the tradition of what we understand. They're much more ironic and and sort of obviously influenced by Leone, but they're they're much more kind of playing around with the form. Now he wouldn't. I don't think he's the kind of guy who would go, "This is what I'm doing." You know, I'm going to break all the rules. I'm going to kind of reinvent the Western. I think he just goes, I want to tell this story. But how he tells that story and why he tells that story is kind of jazz-like. He, and that has something of that European in it. Uh, that yeah. has something of that. I don't, you know, he, I'm sure he's watched all the films, you know, and, and he knows European cinema. I just think he doesn't self-analyze the way that those other 70s filmmakers love to do. And yeah, I, 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 I've interviewed him a couple of times, and as soon as you get on to meaning and you know infer things or you know, imply things in his films, he gets resistant. He, he's, a, he's a gentleman, and he goes with it. Yeah, he understands Unforgiven's relationship with his career. He knows all that, but he won't really sort of let that go. He won't let it. You go, oh yeah, that's you know I'm influenced by this, but just go. I like the story. That's, you know, I, I yeah. got on with telling it. You know, that, that's the Clint way. The obvious in European input would be the Sergio Leone uh, Westerns, which which marked his move from television into cinema. And uh, and the sort of the production history of those is is 
in itself kind of really interesting how he became very famous in Europe before he became famous in the United States because of the Kurosawa legal case against uh, Leone for plagiarism. Though, I mean, I love those movies. Those movies, yeah. I think the God, the God, the Bad and the Ugly, well, the Freudian <laughs> slip, if you like, but the, the Bad and the Ugly is, is up there with what in my top 10 of, of, of films, I think. Um, and the other two are not far behind. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it has a strange relationship with them, or had a strange relationship with them. I think he, he sort of made his peace with, with them now because of the way they were written about. Because, yeah, he went, he, he came, he was a television star. You know, he'd done Rawhide and, you know, as, as once upon a time in Hollywood, kind of, um, you know, makes a gag about it. He goes off to Europe because no one else will, will really have him to make films with this, who he thought was a chance. He just thought he was going to join some kind of runaway train in Europe, make a quick buck and come back to America and hope things would have moved on and he was going to escape the kind of thrall of Rawhide and the kind of kind of traditional kind of character he was playing in Rowdy Yates. But something, you know, incredible happened in, in Spain with this Italian maestro. And it was kind of, it wasn't really a sort of meeting of minds, but it was serendipity in the kind of the twin forces, the only exuberance and invention and love, but playfulness with the nature of genre, because that's all he knew. You know, he was, you, know, you just sort of celebrated it and made it up and you sort of pretended it was Western because that's what you thought Westerns were like, but of course, actually it was operatic and mm. wonderfully European and very funny, but actually strangely quite profound as well. And, yeah, this kind of rigid, but iconic, incredibly charismatic actor who was couldn't understand a word anyone was saying to him virtually, and you know everything was done by sign language. Yet there was something going on in that kind of uh, that juxtaposition of opposing energies that created you know the spaghetti feeling, the spaghetti mood. And the more you read about that time, the more you realise Eastwood was vital to it. Mm. Uh, I know it's Leone is the genius and Leone and obviously Morricone's input and all those wonderful, wonderful things. But, you know, the costume was was Eastwood. You know, there right. was no like money for a costume. So he went out and about in Hollywood and just bought these things. The, the cheroots, the, the small cigars, which he hated, they were his own idea. And Right, right. Because a lot of that is disputed. I've read uh, yeah. Leone claims to have put stuff together. And so there, there is... I know, it's, 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 it's kind of embalmed in mythology now. Sure. A lot of it. Um, and I suppose I came from it, from Eastwood's perspective. But you're like, I, I do think that he started to understand something which about those films. He understood his place in them. And he understood their play with the genre. And I think he started to enjoy what he could do within it. And as you say, to get to the good, the bad and the ugly, and there's such confidence in not only Leone's approach, but in Eastwood's. Mm. He just occupies the, you know, he's the gravitational center of the entire Spaghetti trilogy. He holds it down from being absurd. You know, he gives it the weight it needs. And I'm sure... Yeah, as he began to direct, and he, you know, famously, you know, he, the Unforgiven was dedicated to both Sergio and Don, it's in Don Siegel. But he really did take a lot of what uh, Leone did on board, especially in the way he did Westerns. The Outlaw Josie Wells, you know, it's not a spaghetti Western, it's not Leone like, but there's something Leone in it, mm. in its kind of brio and its kind of enjoyment and its sort of the way it hovers on the edge of comedy. And but yet has this kind of wonderful um, sense of orchestration, you know, of spectacle, you know, of mm -hmm. landscape. That you know, is something I think he he brought back with from Leone. I mean, they did fall out. Yeah, you know, they did. It kind of ended poorly. And Leone wanted him to do Once Upon a Time in the West. Famously, obviously, it's the, the role went to Bronson, who was offered. He wanted him to do the um, the main character harmonica. He wanted him as harmonica man. Yeah, ah, essentially right. written for Eastwood. Right. And Eastwood was done. Yeah, he, he'd made three films. He was now getting wealthy. He saw, you know, that they've been released in America from 1967. Mm. MGM brought them, you know, brought them finally and were finally releasing them. And they took off like a wildfire. And I think at that point, Eastwood said, well, I can do something with this. I can ferment my own stardom within the Hollywood system. Um, so it wasn't wholly a snub of, of Leone. It was a certain sense of his own destiny he was taking control of. 
But I think Leone took it quite personally, as only Leone could. Yes. And for a long while, there was a kind of silence between them. And it took a number of years, I think, before Eastwood sort of made his peace with his own past, I think. I think it was in the Crest Frailing book, the story that Leone wanted the three characters from Good, the Bad and the Ugly to be the three guys waiting at the railway station for Bronson to turn <laughs> up. And I, I think that must, maybe that was a suggestion after Eastwood had turned up. It probably down. was a subsequent debate. Yeah. And, and, he, and Eastwood was like, I'm, no, I'm not going to be shot in the first five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no way. It's a wonderful idea, but yeah, it's... A... <laughs> You know, it's, it's, yeah, and you can see in Harmonica Man, you know, the way that could have been the Eastwood character, you can see the archetype is maintained. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's probably a good thing that it, Once Upon a Time in the West is what it is, and it's glorious as it is. And, it, you know, Eastwood needed to go off and, and become his own man. But the connective tissue, certainly as Eastwood as a director, back to Leone, uh, is enormously strong. And mm. again, it's another thing I think that makes Eastwood so much more than what he's perceived as, and so much more of a 70s kind of director on the quiet, that you watch something like High Plains Drifter, even you know, the lesser ones. You know, and it's a kind of a remarkable journey to watch all his films in one go, you know, virtually. Um, you get the trace, you think, oh, this film's quite strange. These films are odd. They don't do... The, the regular things at all. He goes up at weird swerves and really weird moral textures, some of which have dated. Um, oh, my God, yeah, High Plains Drifter is a definite, uh, you know, yeah. jokes about rape and, and a, a, a horrible rape scene that's kind of, yes. as you say, has that sort of 70s, which, I mean, to to, I don't know if necessary to be fair to the film, but that was, uh, you know... In the novel One um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the idea of rape as a liberating act uh, was around in that period yeah. of of like Oz of, of revenge of a. It, it's it's a horrific idea now, but it was there in the culture. Eldridge Cleaver wrote about it, for instance. And it's it's it's, it's a fascination of Eastwood's, if not a minor obsession, certainly in the nineteen right. seventies. You know, in a kind of very interesting and slightly discomforting way, you know, it's rape is continually brought up in his films. Poor Sandra right. Locke, you know, is attacked frequently in in his films, and right. usually he saves her from from a beat, you know, from from a rape. But it's, it crops up enough that you you become a bit like, well, what is his what is his fascination? And what's kind of contrary to that, and it's really interesting, is that. He's one of the few directors to bring in and make very strong female characters, you know, in his films. You know, he, although he's always sort of written about and described as, you know, macho, all this kind of machismo. And, of course, there's that there, although I'd argue a lot of it is, is self-parody. The female characters are, are really strong, right from Play Misty for Me onwards, that they're written in very dimensional ways and he's very interested in them and he doesn't... Uh, depict them in obvious, you know, cliched ways. He opens that up. He opens them up to threat. I mean, um, you know, everything Sandra Locke does in those films is becomes more and more fascinating when you realise they're in a relationship. But right. all, you know, all the, you know, all virtually all of his female characters, I think, for the beginning half of his career, probably right through to Million Dollar Baby, you know, including British Madison County, are fully dimensional. He's very interested in women. He's very excited by the idea of portraying women, yet he also has this dark way of looking at them through this kind of prism of, you know, rape, this kind of theme that crops up in his films. It, it's impossible to know where it comes from, but it was, as you say, in the 70s, there was a kind of weird um, obsession with that as a kind of a, a fictional idea. Yeah, I mean, we talk, uh, talked to Molly Haskell a few weeks ago, and she, of course, her 1970s book about women in Hollywood is called From Reverence to Rape. And and she very much sees New Hollywood as all these men who are, who are not interested in women other than as victims or, or, I mean, in the case of, say, someone like Sam Peckinpah, delighting in to some degree in the victimization of women. I wouldn't put Eastwood in that yeah. category. And I'd also say, having brought up Peck in part, that he's an interesting character because I don't think Eastwood's Westerns are anything like Peck in Pars. You know, I don't think he's 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 got a totally separate strand. I think Peck and Pie is much more the disappointed romantic, yeah. whereas Eastwood is much more doing something entirely his own. 
He's really much more, I think, he's much more interested in what it takes. You know, it's, it's mm. this kind of survivalist idea. And again, it comes back to the idea of how was America born? You know, how was it created? What were the birth pangs it had to go through? Civil war, you know, the, the frontier, the kind of the idea you know, in Unforgiven, this is kind of central idea about you know, is is little Bill Daggett, the Gene Hatman character, is he the most civilized character in the film? Because he's trying to build a house, you know, and he's trying to get a town to work, you know, on, but he's also a psychopath, you know, and he's kind of kind of weird contradictions. And his house about. is falling apart, which is kind know, of funny, but also precisely the point of the metaphor. You know, you can't yeah. build a house and not get your angles right. You, you, you know, you have to. I, I just want to break off for a second yeah. and ask you a, a, like a, a personal question. Where, where, when do you first remember coming across an Eastwood as a figure? I remember it being on TV, you know. Yeah, they... I, I think I, you know, I'm, I'm slightly older than you, but we come from a similar era, I think, of where we got into film. And I have such uh, enormously important memory of being about 12 years old and being in a friend's house. And his father put on, I think it might be my father, it might have been his father, my memory sort of a bit uh, said, this is film you're going to enjoy, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And when you're kind of 12 years old, the idea of a Western is a bit boring. Right. You know, it's what your dad watches. Uh, I wasn't quite sort of re- you know, ready for kind of that. I wanted to watch science fiction films or whatever it was. Um, but I watched it because that was what was on the television. And I just remember being gripped and almost electrified by kind of what the film did. And obviously, when you're 12, you can't quite articulate it. Mm. Looking back, it's how much personality that film had, that it was a genre film, but there was something more to it. You know, it had this kind of texture and this humour and this cool, this kind of kind of comic book cool about it that was just mesmeric when I watched it. And obviously Eastwood's right at the heart of that. And, you know, you just want to be Eastwood when you're 12 years old and you watch The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. You miss out probably on the more nihilistic <laughs> um, you know, the commentary on violence in the West and, and those things. Never have I seen like, so many good men wasted so badly. <laughs> that music is like an extra character. It's, mm. it's an, another dimension to it. And I suppose, I think I've got memories of Where Eagles Dare and various. My dad was hugely into Clint Eastwood because it was all dads were at that time. <laughs> and, yeah, he would go to his Eastwood film. I remember not being allowed into Firefox it was like an a, a or a double A, and I went with my double, dad, yeah. and they sort of went, no, we can't get in. I must have been, I don't know, I must have been about 12 or 13 at the time, and they wouldn't let me in. And I just, and being, so so reading the novel of Firefox by Craig Thomas and <laughs> the sequel, Firefox Down, which is, uh, which I have no real memory of, but he crashes the plane, and so it's all about him. Not being captured. Well, not getting captured. I mean, Firefox is really interesting. Yeah, it's such an anomaly. Yeah, yeah. It, it's sort of Spielberg's attempt to get on, get in with the 80s. You know, this is what's going on around him, special effects and kind of big blockbusting you know, kind of style movies, none of which he'd, he'd been involved in. But he has this kind of, and he does have this in him, this kind of idea where every so often he sort of looks over the garden fence and sees what the rest of Hollywood are up to and goes, well, should I be attempting some of this? Should I be involved in some of this? And he sort of slips out and he sort of, and he gets so bored with the, the special effects. He gets so fed up with the kind of the kind of discipline you know, that's required for one of those big movies. And if you watch it, it's a really strange beast, Firefox. Half of it yeah. is this really dark, kind of Le Carre-esque espionage thriller but someone gets their face beaten in to replace him and they 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 have to beat his face in just so they wouldn't be identified i remember being really shocked by that (laughs) at the time i remember who's the guy from yes minister is it nigel nigel hawthorne isn't it hawthorne yeah was on Logan. And they were saying, oh, so you've made a film with Clint Eastwood now, says Terry Wogan. God, I'm, good, I'm doing all the voices today. And, uh, and he he said, yeah, oh, it was awful. He said um, Clint Eastwood kept saying all the way through the film, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Special effects in the second half are going to be amazing. They'll save the film. And, you know, you don't need to worry about the story or anything. And then I went to see the film and it was like, oh, not oh, that good. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so like, I sure had a point. And... <laughs> yeah. I remember being enormously troubled by the side of it. He steers the plane by thinking in Russian. Yes. It's like a kind of telepathic connection with the plane. I kept thinking, like, 
How do you think in Russian without thinking first in English and then translating it to Russian? <laughs> What logic did my head in? It just didn't seem to be that much of an advantage, you know. You just a second advantage, just make your button faster. Um, <laughs> it's yeah, it's a it's a funny one, but I mean, in a way, Firefox he has these periodic moments, as you say, where he looks over the fence. I mean, the Iger sanction is yeah. uh, is a kind of, you you point out it's a kind of James Bondy sort of you know action. I mean, we, looking at it today with retrospect, it looks like something like Cliffhanger or something like that, but but. I mean, even Dirty Harry is him sort of going, OK, I don't want to just make Westerns. Like he is self-aware enough and, you know, he, he's had a 50-something year career. To have a 50-something career, you've got to know how to stay relevant. You've got yeah. to know how to ride the currents of Hollywood. And certainly until Unforgiven, maybe, he, he wasn't this sort of eminence grease of, of, of kind of the Hollywood world. He didn't have the path to do whatever he wanted. He doesn't. He never quite had that anyway, but, you know, up to the point where he became establishment, he still, like every other director and every other star, had to keep it going, had to maintain it. So I think he had an awareness that commercial failure is bad for you and commercial success is good for you. And every so often thought, well, let's try something, that hoping it would be a big hit. Firefox made money, and mm. I guess Sanction to an extent made money, but you watch both those films, and you can see the kind of eastwardness of them strain against the formula. So the Iger Sanction is this rather potty assassination spy thriller in which he has to join a climbing team. It's currently far, ridiculously far-fetched. He has to join a you know, sort of um, flush out a killer, an enemy killer. It's part of this, I can't even remember why he's a member of this, this Iger climbing team, but he is. And so they have to find a, not only a spy who's a good assassin, but also really good at climbing mountains. And he has to go up the Iger and flush out this killer. And, he's and also it. an art historian. I mean, he's, he's, like, he's, right, yeah. he's basically Mr. Ben. He just goes yeah. into another, and he goes into the costume shop and puts on another costume. And yeah. I mean, I feel this is, I mean, we mentioned uh, already Dirty Harry, but I feel that happens with the sequels in Dirty Harry that, um, when you see Dirty Harry, it I mean, Dirty Harry, I think, is a masterpiece. It's an amazing film. It's brilliantly directed by Don Siegel. It's a really interesting neo-noir, you know, and again, like, it's a proper 70s movie. Then you go to Magnum Force, and it's already kind of more of an action movie, and he sleeps with a girl, and he's, you know, and it's just, it loses that noirish sort of, he's a loser guy and become sort of like he's a a, a hero. Yeah, it, it, you know, Dirty Harry, Harry Callahan, obviously at the, the time it happened, you know, made Eastwood the biggest star in the world. It, it right. just elevated him to a place that, you know, there'd been stardom, but it was a kind of almost a new form of stardom that was invented with that. And I, I think it was both kind of a blessing and a curse to him. It was, yes, it made him stardom. It probably helped him get a lot of films made. It helped establish him as director. And, you know, it brought the money in. There's no doubt about that. But he, it was something he couldn't quite escape and was always pulled back to. At first, I think, because he felt he wanted to make sequels and wanted to explore the character and wanted to explore the phenomenon of, of Dirty mm -hmm. Harry. Kind of what did that mean? And then I think eventually, a little bit more, he'll do a Dirty Harry for the studio as long as he got the chance to do bird or you right. know, something that's kind of quirky and interesting on his, you know, on his own sort of behalf. But, you know, it's a kind of strange mix. Uh, you know, if you watch those Dirty Harry sequels, no, he only directed one of them, which is Sudden Impact. Right. So they're sort of slightly separate from him as, as an artist. Yeah, obviously he's absolutely integral to what they are, the feeling they have, how they were made. And, for a lot of them, he became the creative force without having the directing reins. He brought in guys who were second unit directors who'd worked with him, part of the Eastwood family, but essentially knew they were doing his bidding in terms of those films. And I think they get a little bit lost in that. Either Eastwood, you know, direct them and make them yours or don't. And I think they get right. lost in the, in the middle ground. In the second um, guessing, I mean, Ted Post yeah. was real was really critical of Eastwood as uh, you know he saw like the first one he did with Don and he was really on it and he was you know he's great and everything and the the second one he was just like that's good enough I, I can you know no one in my fan 
space is going to notice it's going to be any better than that. I mean, yeah, that's a disgruntled employee as well to some extent. But there's an element of he does leave behind some of these disgruntled people because yeah. he's, as you say, he's he's kind of taking over the reins. I mean, Phil Kaufman gets fired from Josie Wales. Yeah. And there's another director who you, you bring up who basically... Yes. it's, oh, it's Tightrope. Um, Tightrope. And that's a great yeah. film, Tightrope. That's a really kinky film in... Tightrope's remarkable. And again, we come back to this, this argument, that, you know, is he a 70s filmmaker? And you mm. look at the Tightrope and... Yeah, it's kind of getting into the eighties, but it's it's an old older style film, and so interesting because it sets up a, a kind of formulaic idea: cop tracking down serial killer, puts it into an interesting city, New Orleans, because it was written to be San Francisco, but Eastwood went, "This not, I can't do it in San Francisco. That's kind of dirty Harry's ground. Right. I've got to do something new." And again, a smart choice. It's take it to New Orleans where they could shoot in real brothels and real kind of sex and dens and shops. And you realise that the, the film gets less and less interested in the plot, the mechanics of who is the serial killer, and more and more interested in the character that Eastwood is playing, that he's a good cop, he's a good father, he's a romantic interest to Genevieve Bajold, yet he's also a pervert and a, and a kinky guy and has this kind of dark side to him. And for Eastwood to sort of let that happen, to let that contradiction come into his character, seems shocking. But There's it's a bit of Al Pacino's cruising in there as well. Yeah, at that point. Yeah. I remember. And because it's him, it's almost more unnerving and shocking. The the kind of the, the sweatiness of it all, the grubbiness of it all, is is quite convincing because it, almost because of his rigid nature that he, you know, he's not loose like Pacino, who can just kind of throw himself into a world. Eastwood is still Eastwood, wherever he is, you know, in terms of the film. But that adds, I think, to Tightrope. It gives it this, this dimension of, yeah, he's just, you know, he's an ordinary guy with this, this this side to him. And, of course, being a cop and the case, sort of bringing it out, you know, into the open, that's quite fascinating. And that's so mm. 70s, you know, what is this film about? Well, it's kind of about the case. It's really about just this guy and, yeah, character study. Yeah. So let's get on to the to the sort of like the moment where he's he, he reinvents himself once more in a way. I mean, although reinvent it sounds a bit too much like Madonna, but he it, it's almost as if like Hollywood is catching up with him and finding out. Oh, actually, this guy's you know he's been knocking around for ages, and it, we can't we still can't quite pin him down. So Bird, I think, is kind of a masterpiece. I think that's, that's amazing. And I have a lot of time for, obviously, Unforgiven is a masterpiece. And then you have, you know, Black Hunt or White Heart. You have all these films around that period, which are just sort of like, I would never have thought Clint Eastwood was would be the guy making these movies. And he has a whole bunch of them. Yeah, it's, I mean, the traditional sort of way of portraying the Eastwood arc, the Eastwood trajectory mm. is to go... He was Dirty Harry, he was a successful director, he made Westerns, then he makes Unforgiven and he redefines himself and he redefines his career and he sort of redefines Hollywood to a certain extent. I think, you know, as you say, there was Bird, you know, there's Outlaw Josie Wales. There's a lot of those films along the way that the leap to Unforgiven isn't actually as big a leap as you think it is. Right. It, yeah, he was, he was getting there. And because his films were already, you watch Bronco Billy, um, Absolutely, top man, and you know they're not as assured a piece as Unforgiven, but they're really fascinating studies of flawed men, you know, slightly insane men in their own way, and and studies of America and and studies of genre and sort of cultural contexts. You know, Bronco Billy is about uh, you know, a modern day Wild Bill kind of showman who is clearly nuts, and, and the film's kind of nuts. It's Don Quixote in, in, yeah. you know, in a cowboy hat. Yeah, absolutely. And it's got, the film has got this wonderful sense. It doesn't quite know what it is. Is it, a, is it a Western? Is it a comedy? Is it a rom-com? You know, it's just got all these kind of weird parts to it. Uh, don't ultimately completely fit together, but it's a wonderful kind of journey to go on. And Honky Tonk Man is that as well. It's the singing, it's the musical, but it's, it's the kind of self-destruction. You know, he plays this kind of country and Western singer who's got, uh, tuberculosis basically and so it's an arc towards death and it's just kind of incredibly dark <laughs> you know you know yeah. see, we decided we think you know he's just dirty harry he's just the big iconic cop or the iconic you know cowboy is wrong 
And actually, the, the what's made, as you say, we get to Unforgiven. But we've had Bird, which is an incredibly complex story of a, a, a jazz musician played by Boris Whitaker, um, this kind of incredible saxophonist, who obviously, as, as, a, as a jazz aficionado, Eastwood was fairly obsessed with. That is a kind of incredibly jagged, complicated narrative piece that moves around in time. That sort of does, it doesn't just tell you a linear biopic. It just does all sorts of complicated things with form. And there's an element of self-portraiture in there, I think, that Eastwood sort of understands something about himself and lets it out just occasionally, that he's got something slightly self-destructive, that if the career had gone another way, you know, he could have been Honky Tonk Man, he could have been Bird, that there's something, mm. you know, he came from a poor background, he came, he struggled. So it's not like he views himself as a kind of deserving soul, that, you know, the great line in Unforgiven, deserves got nothing to do with it you know it's it's sort of right. a fascinating sort of bridge of playing around with icons playing around with this extraordinary idea of showing america for what it is and his own personal story wrapped into that and that comes to this extraordinary apotheosis with unforgiven which you know, obviously as a famous story goes he was sitting on for 10 years or nearly 10 years to, so he was ready for it he was old enough for it and i think right. that's not just how he looked. I think that's about who he was as a director and an artist. That you got to know you're ready to to tell that story and, and to tell that piece. But that's you know, take it seriously, bit, yeah. like not Magnum Force. We're going to do three yeah. or four takes if that's what we need. You know. Yeah, and just I was thinking it's kind of you know he doesn't see things retrospectively like we do. He's mm. not reading backwards, so he won't go. Oh yes, I knew Unforgiven was going to be this major statement about my career. I kind of wanted to make it because it was my big thing, closing off a genre, ending an era, starting a new one. I don't think he would ever perceive it like that. Yeah, I think there's a subconscious understanding of the material that you know grew into this masterpiece, that he understood that there was a great thematic power in it, and it was intimately related to who he was as a Hollywood person and as an actor and as a director. That if I could, you could throw it all in, mm. something would emerge that was very important. But he kind of, I remember him doing Pale Rider and thinking, oh, here we go again. You know, I mean, come on, he, he, you know, Clint, do something else. And then so when Unforgiven was sort of like trailed, it was like, okay, another. And then you started hearing the buzz and that it was good. Yeah. And and I mean, Pale Rider isn't a bad film. It's not a, but it but the, it feels much. It's interesting to put the two together actually because it feels more sort of run of the mill. Um, yeah, it, it's better than that. But beside Unforgiven, it's on. Yeah, Unforgiven's on a different level. It does have that weirdness. Yeah, if you look at most of his westerns, uh, certainly the ones he directed, and maybe I mean Josie Wells kind of. And um, they're ghost stories. They're yeah, all they're yeah. like supernatural. And they're all about you know, these figures who are sort of part of the mythology. High Plains Drifter. He just arrives at the beginning of the film. And at the end, he rides away again. And you're not sure if he's even alive. You know, is he a kind of embodiment of vengeance? You know, is he, there's kind of a, a reading of it that he's the brother of the, the, killed, the murdered sheriff. But he feels to me like he's the, the murdered sheriff reborn. And Eastwood's kind of happy for you to go with that reading of it. In Pale Rider, he, he's, you know, the, the girl prays for him and he arrives and he's a priest and he's a kind of a biblical figure who comes in. And of course, he's got the, the dog collar and he's a sort of, again, he's the kind of figure of vengeance. And he's got like bullet right. holes over his heart as well. It's just yeah. like, how the hell did he survive that? Exactly. They, I love that kind of slight frisson of, what, what genre exactly are we watching here? Yeah, it's what? gothic almost coming from yeah. Beguiled, coming from Don Siegel's, uh, you know, southern gothic of, of Begu the Beguiled. Yeah, just out of stretching things beyond, the, you know, their regular form. Yeah. I think yeah. that, yeah, that's certainly there in Unforgiven, but I think Unforgiven is actually slightly more realist than that. It's, you know, it comes back to, again, it's about mythology and it's about legacies. But, of course, the idea is to show legacies for what they actually are that the idea of the heroic gunslinger or even the anti-heroic gunslinger is then plucked open you know that fantastic opening where once we get to eastwood's character he can't even get on a horse anymore you know he just keeps falling off the horse he can't hit the can you know he's, he's useless he's addled and it's kind of a fantastic kind of statement right at the beginning of the film 
that all those ideas you have of Eastwood are cast out, cast aside. Yet what they'll do is gradually reform as the film goes on. And but they'll reform in a way that we as the watcher are starting to go, but should we cheer him on? Where, where, where am I meant to be? How do I meant to feel? Yes, the, the kind of the venging spirit is coming back to us, but I'm not sure that's a good idea. And it's that's what's brilliant about it, because you as the viewer are, are not allowed to be settled. You're not allowed to sort of go, yes, this is what I wanted. You kind of do. Mm. You know, the final scene where he goes in and, and reaps carnage and you're, it's not shot in a glamorous way. It's not shot like Leone or even like Eastwood's previous Westerns. It's shot like documentary almost. It's blunt, terrible. And death is is, is kind of abrupt. And you think, God, this is just so powerful. You might want to clear out behind that guy before shooting yeah. him. You know, I mean, it's just like, it's just, you know, just get out of the way. I, mean, I don't want to shoot you yet. You know, I'll, I'll get to you. <laughs> Um, I mean, we talked earlier, we intimated perhaps that uh, the idea of masculinity in Eastwood isn't as straightforward as it sometimes uh, appears to be. And uh, Unforgiven and practically all the films we, we talk about, I think the masculinity is really perched. There is a real sense of fragility in there and, and, you know, as strong as it might seem. I mean, this film starts with a woman getting her face cut up because a man gets his penis laughed at and reminding me of the Margaret Atwood quote that, you know, men are scared that we'll laugh at them. We're scared that men will kill us, you yeah. know, and that, and that, that's, I mean, you, you yeah. mentioned a couple of times in the book, the sort of feminist Clint Eastwood. And I think there is an argument there as much as there's also misogyny and there's also, you know, the, it, it's kind of all part of the pie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah, Unforgiven, it, it opens with, you know, a woman laughing at manhood, you know, uh, yeah, mm. manhood is mocked at the beginning of the film. And that's the whole theme of the film, manhood being mocked and undone, all the male characters maybe with the slight exception of Morgan Freeman, are mocked and, and shown for much less than you know, they consider themselves to be or portray themselves. And I think that, that that does cross a lot of the films as well. I think certainly, again, certainly the ones he directs, he plucks open this concept of, of macho. And, and I think he, he's very interested in it because it's so applied to him through his own stardom that he represented a kind of this kind of icon of pure machismo that Dirty Harry's a guy who can just get the job done, even though if you watch those films, they're not quite like that. The, and, first, the first Dirty Harry I rewatched recently, and he's, yeah. he's absolutely awful as a policeman. They're sort of saying, you know that we can't, uh, you know, all that, that evidence that you got is inadmissible. And he's like, why? And he's like, <laughs> the, the Miranda rights have been in for five years, Harry. You know, you've got, <laughs> you know, come on, you're a detective. You're not like an officer on the beat. You know the <laughs> law. I mean, it's it's just yeah. I don't know. It's like, like you you already know this, surely. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. I cut up your thought. No, but yeah, he's and I think there's this kind of investigation of again, it comes back to sort of self portraiture, uh, you know, and exploring his own place as this kind of symbol. And he, even the first film he made as as a director, Play Misty for Me, is about the arrogance of a man who has a one night stand, and instead of you know him being the vengeful, vengeful spirit. It's the woman who turns into the vengeful spirit. Yes, it's a kind of Hitchcock-like thriller on one level, but it's also, you know, he's got it coming. Mm. You know, Deserve's got everything to do with it and play Misty for me. It's, you know, he's having, he's been careless. He doesn't care and she comes back at him. And she is just terrific in that film. And it's really a signal, I think, of where he goes with this idea of himself. And I think it's it's there throughout. It, you look at it, it's not something like as silly as the gauntlet. Mm. But again, rather like Dirty Harry, he's a terrible cop. He's an idiot. <laughs> and she has to come up. It's Sandra Locke's character, the witness who's seen too much. She has to come up with all the plans. She has to kind of get them through things because he's just the muscle and a bit of a drunk. And it's a parody of Dirty Harry. He knows it's a parody of Dirty mm. Harry. It kind of makes it fun. And you go forwards and you look at Million Dollar Baby. And, you know, it's, it's an old guy who's lost his way and is railing with God about his life and you know, what's gone wrong, his relationship with his daughter that's dissolved and has this new relationship. And he's sort of railing against the fates. 
you know, these aren't people in control of the world. They aren't control of, the, of their situation. It's even Heartbreak Ridge, which I suppose is the kind of the one that we kind of hold up as the kind of cliche of Clint Eastwood, the sergeant, you know, again, the, the kind of the platoon into order. But he's a guy who's lost his way. He doesn't belong to the army anymore. He's a creature of the past who's living on former glories, the, the glory of Heartbreak Ridge. And actually, if you watch that, you start thinking, well, yeah, it's self-parody. What that oh, character. it's absolutely hilarious, that film. I mean, it's yeah. really, really funny. And it's, I mean, it, yeah, I'm not particularly keen on the Nicaragua sort of... Yeah, I think they needed some action and they kind of sellotape it on at the end. Yeah, yeah, very obviously. I mean, he does have a, f- a loose and fast way with sort of historical moments as well, Eastwood. I mean, he, he there is... I always find him most questionable when he sort of puts himself forward as a sort of truth teller i'm thinking of jay edgar in particular i also think sully has this thing of like picturing sully as this you know embattled guy who that he's being has to you know face this inquisition a, a huge aircraft lands in a river they have an inquiry regardless <laughs> they, that's, yeah. not, that's not like that they're not picking that's, that's on him due process. You know? <laughs> exactly they're not picking on him they have to find out what's going on it's uh and um you know what i read about the actual inquiry and how the film deals with it is that that it was never for a second in question that he didn't do exactly what was some uh you know he that what he did i mean they had to go through it and make sure you, you didn't have a drink or anything you did this you did that yeah. you did all the rest of it but it, it wasn't, you know, the film invents an antagonist in order to to make the protagonist even better than he actually is. <laughs> it is true. There was, there was there was a kind of late period, probably over the last. I think I'm looking at some dates here. Probably going starting around about 2009, 2010, Invictus, where he did Nelson Mandela, J. Edgar, you know, which is a film that's much less than the sum of its parts. You're, you're like, it should be great, but it's just not where he just sort of got caught up with um, biopics and this idea, I think, of himself as some kind of American historian. And rather than the wonderful kind of mythic work of the early career or the early directing career, where he's dealing with America in a very interesting and authentic way, but without having to be historical record about things, you get caught up on this fiction fact blurring and the films don't seem to be as sort of pungent. I quite like Richard Jewell because it's sort of an inside out hero story. And this is kind of a, a theme in, in um, certainly in the later work, I think, about what is a hero. And, you know, and he sort of prizes that open. If you want to give the controversial American sniper a chance, if you want to kind of say it has value, and I think there are good things in it that concept of American heroism and and its nature is what it's, I think Eastwood's exploring, is that, you know, why do we think... Quite a bit of fragility in there as well. Absolutely. Yeah, this guy's PTSD, he's messed up, you know, he's this incredible kind of marksman sniper, yet he, he doesn't quite understand why that is or what his purpose is in the context of morality and the war... You know, he's fine if he just follows orders. And I think Eastwood actually does throw that open. He he does look at him and go, this is kind of a tragedy, isn't it? Um, and I think some, sometimes this is also partly Hollywood's fault, because I know with American Sniper, the, the antagonist Sniper was the invented thing and that was that happened before yeah. Eastwood he was involved. So it's it's you know, you can see the the writers and producers going this story doesn't have an antagonist so we need to make a composite character who can be the antagonist and it's just like actually you know history is much more interesting if you don't have a clear-cut antagonist protagonist relationship but you know you do you hollywood i think it was spielberg's idea that one because spielberg had american sniper for quite a while right uh, and, and, and those... fl- flags flags of our fathers yeah so they have this kind of thing where spielberg starts a project and then Eastwood sort of takes it over. Um, and in fact, I've this really interesting example of the same idea, isn't it? It's about guys who are, are kind of held up as heroes by some public relations almost. They're kind of, they go on this bond tour and because they're the figures who raise the flag, but they have no idea really why they're there. And they're greatly troubled by this idea that they're heroes. And I think that's, you know, that's kind of a fascination 
for Eastwood, certainly later on. And it, that must, again, be a little bit like him exploring himself because he would have gone, why do I deserve to be this American icon? Why am I, you know, this, this, you know, arguably one of the most famous people alive? Why am I, you know, the great Hollywood sort of godhead where I can do anything and I can, I sort of rest over it all. I mean, I, I sort of make the point that he's sort of there to be Hollywood's conscience, you know, mm-hmm. something of the last 30 years, that as long as Clint's there, doing his thing we can feel all right about being hollywood because he brings the respectability and he brings the authority and you know we've got him look we're all right because we employ clint and that's you know he'll just come along and occasionally he'll do an american sniper that makes 300 million dollars and we're all good yeah but it's it is that also that thing that you know i think there's a thing in america um that we we want our liberalism to be really tough. We can we'll take a lot. So he he can be this tough conservative character with this gritty granite face and and then talk about assisted suicide in Million Dollar Baby in a way that if that was Sean Penn doing it, it would be less acceptable. It would it would be that would be the front and center of that conversation. Um, Jay Edgar can be seen as this sort of. Um, well, as he was a closeted uh, homosexual, Clint can come in and, and do that, but and he won't get much blowback because, and that, and that's also the ambiguity that we have that there are so many Twitter profiles and memes with you know Walt Kolowski's face, which yeah. you you know you just think oh you know, and it. I mean, I saw American Sniper before I heard the discourse, and I remember watching it and going, "That's a really good war film." Uh, yeah. The the end wasn't great. the the bit This bit wasn't good. The baby was a bit weird, but <laughs> but just on a first time watch, it was a re- I loved the beginning with the training scenes and how that was yeah. filmed, and it felt like something new. It felt like if if you didn't have, see Eastwood's name on the titles, you wouldn't necessarily be thinking this is a Clint Eastwood film. And then, of course, then you have the discourse, and it's good to talk about films. This is what this podcast is about. But you do sometimes feel that, like, the film has been lost in the wave of, of you know, argument. I mean, I, I suppose a lot of that, or a lot of, you know, that kind of blowback, if you want, mm. came from the fact that it became this enormous hit. Yeah. That it wasn't just you know, here's this relatively successful Clint Eastwood film that might tread a little strangely in places and might suggest things but it's up to you how you want to read it um because it became a phenomenon and i think it may still be probably the most successful film of his career in the box office terms that yeah jersey boys didn't overtake it i don't think does you know i I don't think cry macho sort of matched there um but i think people sort of thought that was a kind of america adopting it you know and, and there was a concern about was it having a negative effect? Was that, that popularity, you know, a problematic thing? Um, and you're right. I think within that, we lost track of the fact that it's you know, it's a Clint Eastwood film, and in some ways, it's a western uh, you know, in, in, in the nature of the characters and the nature of the portrayal. And it's an exploration of a guy who who is a decent guy who's in a very strange place and starts to wake up to that. And and war has has a has a devastating effect on individuals and it does portray that and i think um sienna miller is absolutely terrific as the wife mm. is almost the, the kind of the prism through which you examine the film is through her eyes because she's seeing her husband disappear from her and i think that's quite an honest way of, of, of looking at it um yeah there's a love there's a love story there as well you know yeah and uh, they're the, the textures that eastwood brings to things that they're never exactly one thing. They're never kind of straightforwardly one-dimensional at all. I mean, to 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 finish with this sort of reaction, to forget finish a little bit with with where we began. Um, I mean, I occasionally write for a newspaper in Italy, Il Manifesto, and their favorite um filmmaker by far, I think, is Clint Eastwood. And Il Manifesto is historically the film, uh, the newspaper of the Communist Party. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to just sort of okay, but let me react to that. But uh... and they and they loved they loved um, American Sniper. They thought it was amazing. You know the the edit film editor there, and so it it just shows that 
I mean, I, to some degree, I would be arguing a little bit with them on that. You know, the, you, it's not that good, <laughs> but you just see how there's so much in there that you can, an uh, Italian uh, ex-communist can see it one way and, uh, you know, right-wing sort of blogosphere American can see it a completely different way and they're looking at exactly the same thing. Yeah, yeah. It comes back really to, you're saying, the central argument. Clint is so much more than Clint Eastwood. Yeah, he, he's such a kind of interesting director. And obviously, there's so many films you're dealing with, and it's such a long career. You're going to have many different kind of points of entry and many different arguments to be had. But at the same time, you know, I don't think there's a single film we couldn't debate mm. for, uh, for the whole of this length. We couldn't pull apart because he throws enormously interesting things into his films. He has a, a, a fascinating looseness with how he edits and directs. And an extraordinary facility for character. I don't think there's a, you know, there are you know, bumps and, and sort of mistakes along the way that films don't quite well. Hereafter is become an odd film. I don't think it quite comes together. Jersey Boys, it's, it's a bit formulaic. Um, but most of them all have interesting things in them and always have interesting characters in them. You know, he's so good at character. You know, not just mm. the characters he plays, but the, all the characters in the films that they're endlessly fascinating. I mean, the problem with writing the book was, you know, you only have so many words and you have to deal with certain films, you know, in a couple of paragraphs where you just want to write a whole chapter on them because as you start, as you watch them again and as you start writing about them, you're like, oh my God, there's so much more to say about this. But you can't. So you have to sort of see things in broader terms, you know, the career movements rather than the, the specific specificity. But yeah, he's just... He's a great subject, but he's a better subject than even that when you start writing about it. Right. You start thinking, yeah, because he, he he's so much more than what you expect. Well, I mean, I've had you on uh, three times, I think, in total. This would be your third. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if, if you, the, you're going to go for the record. What's your next book? Yeah. Next book, I've got a David Lynch book coming up. Oh, when's that uh, coming? That's coming in about a month. Oh, brilliant. So, oh, I'll have you on again for that. <laughs> well, we'll do, we'll do a David Lynch show, completely different subject. But yeah. there are, funnily enough, there are connective things. Both the directors, you know, both are great portrayers of America. Both no, I, great I, I was, that was, I was going to ask you that. I was, we've had you on, uh, I've uh, read your Quentin Tarantino book, your um, Ridley Scott book. And I think that was our first episode. We talked about that. And then uh, Peter Jackson. And we yeah. talked about that in the second episode. And now we've done Clint Eastwood. And now you're going to do David Lynch. I mean, wow! There's a, um, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're you're doing all the all the you know ma- amazing uh, uh, broad swathe of, of directors. And they're also it's also quite terrifying because right. you, know, you get commissioned, you get publisher, and, you get, and suddenly you're sitting there at your desk. And you're going, oh my god, I've got to write about David Lynch. Mm. You know, and it's just you know, for a moment you have a kind of panic and like. <laughs> How can I even get hold of that and, and try and wrap it into something comprehensible? But then you're like, how can I say something new? You know, there's such good writing out there on David Lynch. Probably him more than anyone, I think, in terms of the reading I did. Just fabulous writing on him. You know, really textured, really kind of involved, really mind-boggling. And that was really daunting. Um, it's just as Eastwood was daunting. You know, it was like, how do you get... Eastwood, this kind of Mount Rushmore of Hollywood, and you put him into a book and hope it does something, hope it lives, you know. And yeah, yeah, it, it's always fear that you begin with, and it kind mm. of excitement, you know, mm. you're, you're, you're going on a journey, and but yeah, always fear to begin with. <laughs> I, I was thinking of this the other day about like how easy people get distracted when watching movies these days, and I, you know, I'm, I'm party to that as much as anybody else, but I was, I was sort of We've got to remember, you know, sitting down and giving something two hours of your time is kind of a weird thing. I mean, and that, now we're film critics or we're, you know, as consumers of media, it, it's we're sort of normalizing, normalizing it. Let's binge watch something. Let's. But I remember the just going into a cinema was all like you took a deep breath because it was like, yeah. okay, I'm committing myself to two. You know, if I go to a pub, I can have a drink and come out again. You know. Yeah, yeah, I can sit down. I don't like the food. I'm I'm leaving. You know, but the cinema, you go in and you make that commitment. It's it's, it, you know, we have to get back to how weird that is in the first place. Yeah, and increasingly, I, I realise how important and sort of 
how disciplined it is. Mm, yes. But when I'm in a cinema, I'm kind of, yeah, I don't get my phone out yeah. and the lights go down and I'm no longer in the room I'm in. I'm in the film. I mean, I'm transported wherever this film will take me. Yeah. And I must commit to it. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've walked out of two films in my life, I think, for various reasons. I don't feel I should ever walk out of a film, no matter how bad it is. Mm. I'm going to see it through to the end. And you just, I think you just have a kind of intimacy with that film when you're in a cinema that's totally different from anywhere else. Um, mm. And yeah, I would love to be able to. It's impossible that when you start one of these books, to be able to have a cinema and just go and watch them all in a row. Yeah, with Eastwood, that might be quite difficult because there's 45 films. But um, good God, you know, just to be in that room with them. And I try as much as I can to kind of close off the world, but it's so hard. You're, you're right. But I mean, uh, writing about Malik, there's only a, f uh, you know, it, it's the first two films I hadn't seen on the big screen until recently. And I got to see days of heaven on the big screen. Cause they did a re a new yeah. version. Uh, and that was, that was uh, an experience, but I, I haven't seen badlands on the big screen ever. And that's, a, that's always feels sad. But it's Yeah. Oh you know. yeah. You just think, Oh God, I should, should be seeing it in that right, the right sound, the right picture, yeah. the right feeling. You, know, you should be going to watch the gauntlet in a cinema in the 1970s with a sort of sticky carpet and sort of horrible, uncomfortable yeah, seat. You should see Dirty Harry sitting next to Mark Ruffalo and he'll come out and say, you know, <laughs> what happened to the Zodiac Killer? Ah, oh, they shoot him in this one. <laughs> Brilliant, Ian. Could I ask you for a recommended book? I mean, do you have time to read books when you're writing so I many? I do. It's kind of like when you're in the world of the book you're writing, there's a, there's yeah. a danger if you read, you know, not only read outside of the subject, you read someone really good and then you're just like, damn you, you're yeah. just really good and you have to kind of confidence, you know, crisis of confidence, all those things. But I am keeping up. I loved Sam Wasson's book on Chinatown, The Big Goodbye. Um, I, I think I tweeted about that. I loved it so much. It made me angry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I hate him. I, I mean, I've thought, I, I hate I, you he, because he's brilliant. Um, he, and he's doing the Zeotrope one. Uh, yeah, which I can't to... wait to read, but I know it will drive me insane. Having written about Coppola, I know he'll write a wonderful, wonderful book. And I do find them inspiring. Uh, I do. I loved uh, Dana Stevens' book on Buster Keaton. Cameraman, um, yeah. Yeah, just, uh, and I think I've come to the realisation that there is only one genius in the history of film. And that's Buster Keaton. Yeah. Yeah. You could yep. talk about Kubrick and Spielberg and Chaplin. No, there's only one genius, and that's Buster Keaton, because yeah. he didn't understand why he was so brilliant. It was just instinct and that's sort of the nature of genius. So I really enjoyed that. Um, and so I do try and, and I'm reading Ian Penman's book on Fassbinder at the moment, which is completely different. Right. Uh, it's quite philosophical and it's sort of written in a kind of a, a numbered format, like a, a long list. But a great sort of opening up of a world I don't know a huge amount about, that sort of post-war sort of neo-German cinema, you know, Fassbinder and Werner Herzog, the early years. You know, I love Vin Vendors, especially the early career of Vin Vendors. Mm. It's kind of wonderful about that world, but also the craziness of what Fassbinder represented. You know? And so I mean, it's always a learning curve for me. I, I know you probably feel the same. But, you know, I, I'm learning my craft. I will always be learning my craft. And I want to read others because they show you how it can be done. And you you get a bit angry and a bit upset because they're so good. But hopefully you learn from them and your next book sort of benefits from it. Yeah, I mean, I I, I, I definitely read your books and I'm thinking, ah, that's how you incorporate that information in there. And ah, that's <laughs> how you begin a that's how you begin a thing. And that's how you 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 know, you put all that those different films together. And it, and it's there is a sort of like um I sometimes say to to Lydia when we're watching a movie, I'll get I'll I'll, I'll say oh, I didn't like that bit, but I'm watching it as a writer because I can <laughs> see that bit. You know, I mean, I'll give you an yeah. example: Django Unchained. There's a uh, there's a bit in Django Unchained where uh, spoiler, um, there's a shootout and Chris Waltz has has been killed, character has been killed, and they capture Django and they decide, oh, we'll send him off to a prison, to a mining operation somewhere. And the writer in me is going, no, 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 no. You force him to fight in the in the the wrestling things that because that's the whole point you you put him back and he yeah. will in order to save the girl he has to kill one of the other guys and that you give him a moral quandary you know and <laughs> that's your ending you know so i can't 
watch that film without thinking you missed a trick man you're supposed yeah, to be a yeah. writer tarantino what, what what's this bullshit about mining he wasn't going around mines earlier why did you suddenly bring that <laughs> in you know? oh i know yeah are you cursed once you start doing what we do you can never fully stop sitting there watching a film going start to write a piece in your head you can't <laughs> yeah. escape it no matter what you want you could be watching Paw Patrol and you'll be starting to come up with something and... <laughs> this is Magnificent Ambersons <laughs> <laughs> absolutely well it's been a joy talking to you Ian as ever um, and I can't wait to to read your Lynch book that's going to be great yeah no it'll be great I mean, it's a different discussion it's a different debate but uh, but you know it's a fascinating world a little bit of a whew, deep breath that was but uh, <laughs> you imagine certainly... From Eastwood to Lynch, but I can't wait to hear how they're connected as well. <laughs> Take care, man. Cool. All right. Cheers, mate. So that was my conversation with Ian. Uh, we had a great wide ranging talk i mean it was clint eastwood but it was it was a lot of other things as well it was sort of kind of going back into a history of hollywood once more uh, through these figures through these monumental figures in the case of clint eastwood i hope you enjoyed it next week we're going to be looking at a single film uh, courtesy of author Dimitrios Matteo at Mean Streets, Martin Scorsese's breakthrough hit from 1973. Uh, until then, take care. <laughs>